Greetings <coughs> to one and all. On the, we're here in the Holy Apple, 22nd day of Adar 1, 5776. And coming close to the landing of Purim, but we're going to continue here, part number four, with God's help. Islam, Ishmael, end of days for dummies, part, shh, drum roll, four. Okay, just to, uh, last time we were together a couple weeks ago when we did three, part three of it, so uh, we kept everybody in, in suspense. I hope people were able to sleep the last two weeks, didn't stay up. Yeah, I noticed a few uh, <laughs> rings around the people's eyes over here. So, here's how we ended it, the following. When, at the age of 63, Esav and uh, Yaakov, they received the blessings of their father, uh, Isaac. Actually, Isaac, of course, wanted to bless Esav, and then... Uh, Jacob sneaks in, takes the blessing. In the end, uh, Isaac gives uh, Esau a certain blessing, uh, one final, you know, bone there, throws it. Throw that bone over here, Esau, boom, boom, here, catch that bone. And at this time, Ishmael was 63 years old. Okay, so after that happens, uh, Jacob takes off, runs away from home because uh, he's afraid that uh, Esau is going to kill him. Esau understands from his parents' words that his parents aren't too, as they say in Arabic, mabsut. They're not too happy uh, about the fact of who Esau married. So he has this grandiose idea, and he says, I'm going to go. You know what? It's... Uh, how does that song go? We are family. Yeah. Anyways, it's all in the family. All in the family. And let's just... Uh, <clears throat> he goes up to Yishmael. And he says, listen, I have a great idea. You know what I'm saying? I want to marry uh, one of your daughters. I want to marry one of your daughters. And this way we'll be, you know what I'm saying? We'll be family. And he has a great plan. What's his plan? Esau has this great plan. He comes, uh, he's going to come up to uh, Ishmael, and he's going to say, listen, you know, you really should take out, you should really kill your brother uh, Isaac for all the, you know, nasty things that he did to you. He took all your, uh, he took all your blessings. He took your inheritance. He took the land of Israel. You know, you should really get, uh, should really do some kind of, uh, uh, revenge act on him and uh, uh, afterwards okay and afterwards uh, I could uh, after after uh, my father's gone you know because of course Asa had tremendous amounts of uh, honor for his parents so as soon as my father is gone you know either me or you we could take out uh, also uh, Jacob and then we'll take in everything and we'll divide it evenly amongst ourselves. This is a great plan. <clears throat> Anyways, that's how we left it out. That's how we left it. Uh, Ishmael says, listen, I don't really trust you. You're a politician. What's a politician? And one day he says this, one, say, one day he says something else. It's a politician. Whatever, whichever way the winds blow, that's the way he goes. So he says, you're, you're just a politician, you know, you're just, you know, I can't, can't trust what you're saying. Aesop says, listen, if I'm willing to marry into your family, if I'm willing to take your daughter as a wife, with all the responsibilities, will you trust me then? Ishmael says, go for it. Go for it? Okay. But the Torah teaches us something very interesting. That it wasn't Ishmael... That, is brought, that brought his daughter to the wedding evening. In fact, the wedding was delayed. What happened? Chazal teach us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took, killed 
Ishmael. At the age of 137, Hashem takes out Ishmael in order to make sure that the plan does not go through. Now this is an important lesson here in history. This is an important lesson of today, of our future. Hashem is giving us a lesson here that the worst scenario, the worst case scenario is the uniting of forces between Islam and the Christian world. That's the worst scenario for the world and for the Jewish people. And here's where it almost came together. It almost went down. Hashem takes out Ishmael. If we want to connect this to a few ideas, we don't have to go too far. All we have to do is go back in time, four days. We read in the, uh, we read on this past Shabbat, we read the portion of the week was Kitisa, and of course the major theme of Kitisa was the sin of the calf, the golden calf. How did the golden calf look? Hey, I've seen pictures, seen cartoons, you know. I don't know, I don't remember if it was in the Ten Commandments with uh, whoever was the star there. Maybe with Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. Yeah, I got it right. Wow. Some things you don't forget. Anyways, I don't know, I remember exactly if it was in there. But the holy Ramami Pano tells us an unbelievable, shocking fact. That golden calf, how did he look? It's actually had two sides to him. In the front, when you looked at him straight on, he looked like a calf looked like an ox but in the back the half of the back was a donkey now anybody sitting here in this holy hall of study when we hear two words we should have steam coming out of our ears you know like Ooh, we got it or you know like all of a sudden you know lights going out in our heads in our in our eyes jackpot signs Whenever we hear donkey and an ox, we should immediately, whoa, time out on the court. Why? We know that who is the donkey? None other than Ishmael. When, when HaKadosh Baruch when God commands Abraham to take his son Isaac up and sacrifice him on the mountain of Moriah, Abraham tells Ishmael, buddy, you stay here with the donkey. Chazal tell us, don't read with the donkey, instead of im, with, am, the nation of donkeys. Ishmael is considered to be the nation of the donkeys. Then who is the ox? Well, that's also pretty simple. The ox is, of course, Esav, the Christian world. Why? Because we know that who's going to take down Esav? In the end of days, who takes down Esav with a TKO? Only the descendants of Rachel. Who's that? Joseph. Chazal tell us that the descendants of Esav in the end of days will fall only by the descendants of Joseph. And it says in the end of the Torah, Bechor Shoro Hadar Lo, in the blessing that Moses gives the tribe, the, the children, descendants of Joseph, he blesses him with the blessing of an ox, beauty of an ox. Joseph takes down Esau, Christian world, the ox. We know that there are two messiahs. One is Mashiach ben David, how does he come? He comes riding in, not on a Ford, no, not in a Mercedes, not in a, a Ferrari. He comes riding on a donkey. A donkey? Very interesting. Mashiach, 
כן? כן? A donkey, to fight against, who? To fight against Ishmael. And then we have, כן? We have משיח בן יוסף. We have משיח בן יוסף. כן? To fight against, to? To fight against the shore, <coughs> the ox, Esav, Christian world. So it's an unbelievable lesson. The Torah is teaching us, when you see the golden calf, you know what the lesson is? The lesson is that when the Jewish people agreed, because it was really the Arab, it wasn't the Jewish people. When the, how do we say the Jewish people agreed? Very simply. If we look in the Torah and Moshe cries out, whoever is for God, whoever wants to fight against this abomination, come to me, who comes to him? Only the tribe of Levi. Only the tribe of Levi. Okay, I understand that the Jewish people did not participate. But shouldn't it have been if they were 100% clean on this issue of the golden calf, of this idol worshiping form of? They should have all been there. So that goes to show us they weren't clean 100%. There was something lacking in the Jewish people, except for the tribe of Levi. So we see that Hashem is telling us, because of the fact that you agreed, you did not protest against the happening of the golden calf, then you will be ruled by the golden calf. Who's the golden calf? You will be ruled by Esav. You will be ruled by Ishmael. And that's why, open up our hearts here, an amazing Torah. We'll understand it from a totally different angle. We know that every time the Jewish people are punished, the Torah tell, tells us, the Talmud tells us, that there is some kind of zero, zero, zero points, one percentage of a payback for the sin of the calf. Okay, that's what we understood up until today. But now we understand it totally different. When, when we stood silently, everything we suffer for the last 4,000 years, okay, 3,345, 3, 6 years, it's connected to the calf, which means it's connected to the fact that now, from that period of time on, we are going to be ruled by two evil forces, the forces of Yishmael and the forces of Esav, the Christian world and the Muslim world. That's the deep meaning of it. Another, another verse. This time, the Gra hits a grand slam. Boom. There's a verse in the Parsha of Kitetze, the end of Deuteronomy. It says that you should not plow with a, with a donkey and an ox together. Who cares? Who really cares? So the Gra sends one flying over, you know, Wrigley Field. Sends it flying over the whole stadium. He says the following. What does that mean? It means that, Ace, that Esav represents the ox and Ishmael represents the donkey. And it is forbidden to unite these two forces because if these two forces unite, that is the end of the world. They will destroy the world. They will destroy the Jewish people. So do not combine these two forces on the field. So that's the concept of, okay, the concept of the donkey and the con concept of the ox. So we see here, Hashem sees that Esau and Ishmael are about to get together in marriage via, via Ishmael's daughter. Hashem takes out Ishmael. Another one bites the dust. Okay, now, we should all be asking here, we should all be saying, one second here. Now, 
Let me get it straight, okay? Let's get it straight here. Hashem sees that Esav is egging on Ishmael to join the family, and, and Esav is trying to convince Ishmael first to blow away Isaac, and then he's going to blow away Jacob, or Esav himself is going to blow, blow away Jacob afterwards. And Hashem, who does he take away? Who does he take away? He takes away Ishmael. Now, I have a question here. If, if, I, was the, if I was on the trigger... If my finger was on the trigger, man, i take out Esav. Who do you take out? The person that's inciting? Or do you take out the person that's being incited? I don't get it. Why does Hashem... You have two choices here. Either blow away Esav or blow away Ishmael. Hashem says, let it be. Ishmael, you're gone. Adios, amigos, you're out of here. Lehit out, baby. Okay. Then the union is still uh, consummated, no? Right. Okay, let's, let's see here who's hitting. There's a holy book called Siach Yaakov. And here's what it does it. Here's what he writes. First of all, I ask a good question. Listen again to what we said. Okay, let's put the rewind button. We spoke a couple of weeks ago the fact that Ishmael, according to certain opinion, we'll get into it in more detail shortly, but we know that there is an opinion that Ishmael repented. When did he repent? He repented sometime around when Abraham passed away. So Abraham passed away at the age of 175. So Yishmael is 86 years old at the time that his father passes away. 86, something in that area, vicinity. Okay. Now, fast forward, he's now 136 years old, and he agrees, for, he agrees to go in with this plan, this plot, to marry into the family with Aesop, in order that he's going to go out and blow away his brother away. Man, this, uh, this is some kind of balchuva, you know? This is some kind of repenter. So, the Siach Yaakov says the following. Take it easy. How could this be that this is a person that repented? If he's willing, if he's willing to go in on it. He says the following. There's two types of repenting in the world. There's a, sometimes a, per a person repents, and it goes as far as themselves. It goes, the buck stops here, the repentant stops here. It has nothing to do with the generations coming after. Sometimes we see this with um, just this past Shabbat in Elon More, where I live, we had a school that came to spend the Shabbat in Elon More. And they're from, uh, most of them are from the, uh, uh, we'll call it the suit and hat community, the Haredi community, but most of them are from parents that, or one parent that repented, but the families kind of fell apart and you look at these kids and you you can't imagine that their families are from the hat suit and tie group so something here there's there's a repentance here but it's not able to carry it's not able to, it's not deep enough. It's not, it's not in the roots. 
yet in order to influence the generations to come. This happens many times. Many, many times this happens where a parent or two parents, they make tremendous strides, but there's there's still certain things that are lacking that they're not able to pass it over to the next generation or generations. So he says exactly this idea. Yishmael, he did some type of tshuva, some type of repentance he did, but it was only for himself. He was able to just pick himself up. He wasn't able to pick up the generations to come. So that's his type of repenting that he did. Now listen to what he says. He says the following. That Hashem had to take away Esav because if he would have continued, if Esav would have continued being an influence, a bad one at that, an influence on Ishmael, he could have brought him closer to the idea of what he was trying to sell about, you know, blowing away Isaac. So in order that this plan would not come into fruition, Hashem took away the bad influence called Esav. To this we scream out, no! The logic here is not correct. The instigator here the, the troublemaker here is Esau. Him you should have taken out. Not Ishmael. Ishmael's passive. He's one of these hitchhikers. Trampistim. Why does Hashem take out Ishmael? So, in previous lessons, we've given, if you think about it, we've already given possible answers. Answer number one. We spoke about the fact in either Islam for Dummies 2 or 3, we spoke about the fact that the converts that are coming into the Jewish people are overwhelmingly from the descendants of Esav and not from the descendants of Ishmael. There's some kind of spiritual there's some kind of spiritual superiority that Esav has over Yishmael. If we looked, we're not going to go into it again, we spoke about at least 10 people in the Talmud that were from the world of, were converts from Esav, from Rome. We see in the entire, in the entire Tanakh and the Talmud, we see one representative from Islam, from Ishmael, that converted, one. So therefore, the Torah teaches us a tremendous lesson. Even though Esau is a killer, but spiritually, spiritually, okay, it, spiritually he's much better He's higher than Ishmael. He's much higher than Ishmael. So Hashem says, I'm going to take the Esav and I'm going to keep him. And that's why we explained why wasn't he thrown out? Why wasn't he tossed out of his house? Being a bad influence on Jacob. Why was Ishmael thrown out? One of the reasons that we gave is this spiritual reason over here. Because of the fact, the fact is that Hashem looks and what's much more important to us than living is spiritual living. So spiritual living is Esav. And therefore, Yishmael, if I had to choose before the two, Hashem chooses to, to hit Yishmael. That's number one. Number two, interesting enough, very interesting enough, it says in Birkei Dira Abeliezer on the 38th, pair in the 38th chapter, we've spoken about this once in the past, that after Isaac passed away, 
Jacob and Esau got together and they put in all the inheritance that they received and anything they had themselves. They put it all in a gigantic pile. And Jacob says, listen, you take all the money, you take all the cattle, you take all the, uh, all the materialists, all the materialism, and you give me the land of Israel. You give me the land of Israel. And Esau agrees. If we remember a few weeks ago, we quoted various sources. One of them was the Kuzari. Kuzari says that the reason why Isaac, the reason why Ishmael was trying to kill Isaac, trying to kill his brother Isaac when they were young, was that he wanted to, he believed that he was the true inheritor of the Jewish people. He was the, he was the future of Abraham. Number two, he was the true inheritor of the land of Israel. So when Hashem sees these two evil forces that are about to marry in, who does he, who does he blow away? He blows away Ishmael. Why? Because when he looks at Esav, Esav has no problem throwing away Eretz Yisrael. Esav has no problem, okay? Give him a few lentils, you know, give him some uh, milk duds, give him some Nestle Crunch Bars. Man, he'll sell you the land of Israel. He doesn't really, he's not really connected. But Ishmael, Islam, they are connected. They are connected. And therefore, Hashem has to choose between one person. He chooses to blow away Ishmael in order to remove that, in order to remove that tremendous connection they have to the land of Israel. In fact, as we, if we recall, the Zohar Kadosh in the portion of the week, Va'era, he talks about the fact that Ishmael received a certain amount of years to be in the land of Israel, to rule over the land of Israel because of his circumcision that he did. So we see a tremendous connection even after Hashem kills him. Even after Hashem kills Yishmael, there's still this connection between the land of Israel. This connection is stamped A-OK, -okay, approved by Hashem until the return of the Jewish people. So therefore, that's a second reason why Hashem has to choose one. He chooses to blow away Ishmael. Uh, okay. Can I, can I, can I uh, just say... Weigh in, weigh in, weigh in. All right, so just keep in your mind, right, for one second, um, 86 to 136. Keep that for a second. Ishmael is connected very much to ego. It's, he is like an I you know, in first person himself. So, he says, look, I have to honor my father. Abraham is my father. Esau, Abraham is not your father. It's Isaac is your father. So I have to honor my father. I have to do this, what, you know, what I have to do in, 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 in according to this commandment. But at, at 136, he is able now to throw off what he committed to at 86, because in his mind, this was a jubilee. This is 50 years. So he was able to then say, okay, I'll still honor my father as I have to, but I want my children to honor their father, meaning honoring me, and, and for this connection to honor me, my ego, myself, then Asa, I'll bring you in, and you can, you can you know, connect to this honor. Uh, you you get a like on that. You get a like on that one. Now, next part. Uh, we all, can, everything that we're discussing here, of course, it happened, as I like to say, is, was, and will be. Because we know that anything that happens in the Torah is a light, is a directory for us in the future. So that's why we're here today. We're not discussing history, we're not discussing, this. not a museum here. Okay, we're discussing Torah, we're discussing life, how to live. We're discussing how to look at the world. Next question that we're going to ask is an important question, because it has ramifications of our times. The question is, did Yishmael, did he repent or not? If we say that he repented, could be that his descendants, thousands of years later, they'll also, in the end of days, they'll come back. 
and they'll repent. You know, you'll have to, we'll have to learn Arabic or something. Uh, if not, if he did not repent, then, uh, well, we don't have to worry about learning Arabic, I guess. So it's very important. Are they going to the Islam? Are they going to, in the end of days, are they going to see the light? And they're going to come back and, and say, you know, lift up the Jewish people, say, you are the truth? Are they going to do that or not so? So let's look into this question. The Gemara in, in Baba Batra, page 16, side B. It says that Ishmael did tshuva. Why? Because of the fact, number one, that Hashem had promised that his father Abraham would die with, uh, in, uh, in a good uh, pastoral, in a calm death. He would be very, very serene and, and there wouldn't be anything when sometimes when you know that one of your kids went off the track, you know what I'm saying, it's something that sticks with you all the time. It gives you tremendous hardships. You know, your heart it hurts, you're crying all the time in your heart. So it hurts you. So Hashem wanted to, Abraham to leave the world in a peaceful manner, number one. So the Talmud says that he did do tshuva. How do we see this? Because when they went to bury their father Abraham, who goes first? So, you know what I'm saying? When you walk into a door, so it depends where you are. In Israel, you know what I'm saying? Whoever, you know, sometimes not necessarily who gets there first goes in. Sometimes people pushing from the back, they're, you know, oh, we're first. You know, those pushers from the back. So in Israel, sometimes it works differently. But if you're in the States, you say like, okay, ladies first. Why? You're giving an honor to a lady first. You know what I'm saying? You're opening the door. You're the guy. You know, you got the muscles, man. Open that door and let the lady go in first. Right? Ladies first. You have that respect. Ladies first. Okay, so here, who, who goes first here? Ishmael says, okay, Ishmael says, Yitzchak, I want you to be first here. So the Talmud learns from this because of the fact that Ishmael, up until this period of time, he looked at himself as he's the firstborn, he's the continuation of Abraham. But now he puts himself in second place. He puts himself in second place. This is considered to be repenting. This is how the Talmud learns out that, that Ishmael did tshuva, did repent. Okay. Question is, what kind of you know, repentance is this. You know, sometimes we meet people and they said, yeah, you know what, now I've repented. But you see, they're still not keeping Shabbat or they're still touching uh, men, they're still touching women. They still have, you know, they did repent to a certain degree, you know, but what percentage of, what percentage of tshuva have they done? Which we'll see with Yishmael exactly is he a full-fledged repenter or just partially? Very important. Okay. We have a we have a source in Breshid Rabbah 62.2. The Chazal asked a question. In the end of the portion of the week of Chaye Sarah, we have a whole lineage of who? Believe it or not, we have the lineage of the righteous. Usually when the Torah gives lineage, some righteous people, you know? You want to know, like, what we call yichus. You want to know whether you should date somebody. So you want to know who their father is, mother, grandparents, you know? Are they from the, uh, are they, uh, are they from David HaMelech? You know, do they trace themselves back to the Gra? You know, you want to make sure you're getting some, you know, so, a good person here. So, the Chazal say, what's going on over here? Why in the world are we giving the lineage of these wicked people? Wicked people? You didn't hear? Ishmael, he's a Baal Tshuva. Ishmael, he, did, he repented. So there's a dispute within Chazal. There is a dispute. There's this Talmud that we quoted. And there's this Chazal. According to this Chazal, who called Ishmael and his lineage wicked, 
he did not do tshuva whatsoever. Zero. He did not do tshuva. So we should know. Okay, usually we're accustomed to hear that Ishmael repented. So no, next time somebody comes up with that, with that mantra, so just tell them, look in Breshid Rabbah 62.2. 62.2, check it out. Okay, he didn't do it. Okay, next. Uh, second opinion. We explained 10 minutes ago in the book Siach Yaakov that he did a certain degree of repentance which covers himself but does not cover his descendants. Covered him. He himself did repent but that's as far as it goes. As far as the descendants, no. So that's what we have to look forward to. We will see that they will not repent. They will go down as they are, in their beliefs. That's how they're going to go down. So that's according to the Siach uh, Yaakov. According to the Meshech Chochmah, the Meshech Chochmah commentator writes at the end of the Chaye Sarah portion, he says the following, listen closely, he says the following, <clears throat> on one certain issue Ishmael repented. One point! <laughs> you know what tshuva means? Tshuva is something of a life. Tshuva is a lifetime endeavor. To really, to have our minds, you know, to have our minds clear. You know, to be really 100% pure. It's a lifetime endeavor. Project. So, the Meshech Chochmah says, on a point, you know, like, one second, let me get my glasses on. Okay, let's get that microscope here. Where's that point that Ishmael repented? Okay, I see it coming. Yeah, that little point. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, uh, zoom in on it, right? I'm going to zoom it. So he says, what point did he, what point did he do tshuva? That he, he, did, he repented on one point. The point was that he agreed to the fact that really the uh, that really the person who is the firstborn is Isaac because if we remember he was part of the comedian club Yishmael if we remember some months ago we spoke about this Yishmael was in the comedian club what's that you know, SNL, Saturday Night Live, not ready for the primetime players. That's Ishmael. So he was in this group that they said, you know what? Remember when, two, when, when Isaac was two years old, Ishmael was uh, 15 years old. Uh, so they had a big party for the fact that after two years, after Isaac was weaned off, so they had a gigantic party. And who shows up at the party? None other than, than the king of the police team, Avi Melech. And everyone's saying, you know, why is he here? You know, who invited him? Why would he come here? So the comedian club with Yishmael and others, they said, you know why? Because Isaac, he's not really the son of Abraham. Woo, yeah, well, that's a great... So the Meshech Chochma is saying, on this point, he did tshuva. No, I believe... I believe, Ishmael says now, I believe that he really is the first child of Sarah and Abraham. That was his tshuva. Shkoyach! Shkoyach! Wow. Whoa. That took a long time. Ishmael, that was some tshuva you did. You know, like, you had to cut your hair, put on a hat, you put on one of those gartels, you know, have some process. That's what he did. Okay? It does not encompass, this is the Meshech Chochmah, it does not encompass uh, murdering. It does not encompass uh, Im, uh, immoral behavior, uh, etc. That's as far as it goes. Okay. Um, okay. Now that we've taken care of this one, so we see that uh, most of the 
most of the chance is that Ishmael will not do tshuva. We'll see, the, we'll see this even more strong as the time goes by. But it's clear to say that it doesn't look too promising that the descendants of Ishmael, at the end of the days, they'll see the light and they'll put down their swords and their knives and their scissors. If you're 13 years old, they'll put it all down and they'll say, Ahalan Salan, we want to join you, we want to hold on to your, you know, four cornered garments. Okay. Next part of our. Islam for dummies. <clears throat> how bad, how bad is Ishmael? How bad is it? This exile of Ishmael, how bad is it? Okay. So from here, we have an unbelievable paragraph by Rav Chaim Vital. Rav Chaim Vital writes in the book Eitz Haddat Tov, on Psalms 124. Listen closely what he says. <clears throat> there are four exiles. Babylonia, Madai, Greece, and Edom. Christian world. But there is another exile. A fifth. Some people say it's an eighth. There's an additional one that will be in the final days. Which means <clears throat> there are four exiles in the regular time. In regular times. You know, 2,000 years or so. Regular times. When it comes to overtime, when it comes to the final days before the coming of the Messiah, they don't have to be days. It could be months and it could be years. But when we get down to the final, you know, to the final line, there's an additional exile. And this exile is the exile of Ishmael. They're the exile that bring upon the coming of the Messiah. So there are four during the regular time, and there's one which is in overtime. <coughs> That's Ishmael. Says the following, what's the difference between Ishmael and, and the, ex the four other exiles? Four other exiles, they ruled over different nations. For thousands of, for, for hundreds of years, Cain, okay, the Arabs, the Islam, didn't rule over anyone. They were pretty much living in tents and, you know, hanging around the deserts with their, with their uh, camels, camel jockeys. They didn't really, you know what I'm saying, they didn't really mingle with others. So we have the four exiles, which are countries that subserve nations, and then we have these uh, then we have Ishmael, that used to be nomads, you know, in the deserts, hanging around. Until when? Until the end of days. In the end of days, Rav Chaim Vital writes, they will receive, they will receive, they will become rulers. In the end of days, not only over parts of the world, but also over Israel. So very interesting. For example, I've mentioned before, when I was a kid, I never saw a mosque. When I grew up in America, never saw a mosque. I never saw an Arab. Never ran into an Arab. Never saw anybody walking with a kafiyah on the street. Never. Those were the days, my friends, we thought they'd never end. Okay, now another, so that's one difference. It took, it took Islam a while till they started trying to rule and conquer over the world, over Israel. A di another second difference is that what was behind the plan? Why did the four nations that we mentioned, Babylonia, etc., why did they, okay, why did they treat us so cruelly? Why did they kill us? 
Why did they fight against us? And the answer is, they had one, they had one program in mind. That was to remove us, to strip us of the Torah. And sometimes, in order to strip us of the Torah, they had no choice because we refused to leave the, we refused to leave, we held on tight to the Torah. So therefore they killed us because of that. So that was that kind of exile. But Ishmael is different. Ishmael is different. What's his intention? Not to take away the Torah from us, not to take away the mitzvot from us, to destroy us. That's the difference. The first four nations, the intention was not to destroy. If you want to live with us, you know, if you want to, you know, you put on some earrings, baby, and you put on, you know, put on some, some you know, through your nose and through your eyes, and you, you look like us, and you talk like us, and you jive like us, hey man, we're willing to have you. Come on in. Yishmael, okay, and the only reason why they exiled us and killed us and were cruel is because the fact that we were not willing to give in on that point. But if we would have been willing to give up the Torah, the mitzvot, they had no problem with us, no problem living together with us. It's not the case of Ishmael. He's not coming after your tefillin. He's not coming after your tzitzes, baby. He's coming after you. He's coming to destroy you. And therefore, we've never seen, Rav Chaim Vital, we've never seen such an exile. A desire to wipe out the Jewish people from underneath the heavens, leaving us with no remnant of the Jewish people. Amazing thing. That should be ringing in our ears. Whoa. Amalek. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ding, 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 ding. Unbelievable Torah. I heard about 10 days ago from the holy Bilvavi. The Bilvavi writes uh, in one of his, he has 10 books. He writes in his, one of his books, he writes the following. That if you look at the suicide tendencies of Islam, you know, blowing themselves up, bombers, buses, you know, come into your army base, come into your store. If you look at their, these suicidal tendencies, you look at their tremendous amount of sacrifice, where is it, where is it coming? What's the root of it? Some think it's from Islam. The Bilvavi says not so at all. That's not f the root of is the root of Islam. That's not from there. Where is it from, folks? Put on a seatbelt here, because we're going for a spin. The Bilvavi says it comes from Amalek. When you see, when you see these knifers, axers, Molotovs, rocks, when you see them coming, it's not Islam. It's, that's not the root of it. It is Islam. But the root is really the connection to Amalek. Why? Very simply, if we thought about it. What's Amalek? Amalek, in the Talmud, Amalek is likened to a bathtub of boiling water. You know, sometimes you go to a mikvah, you have to be over like 100 years old to get into it. It's like so hot, you don't know how to... You have to be over 100 years old to get in that water. But it's like, oh my God. There's this boiling, boiling hot bath. Anybody that's going to go in there, it's going to get burnt. He's going to have second, third degree burns. There's only one nation that agreed to jump in, so to speak, that bathtub. That was Amalek. Why? They said, you know what? We understand we're going to get third degree burns here. But it's worth it in order to destroy the Jewish people. We'll show the other nations that these are not the invincibles. The Jewish people are not invincible. They can be beaten. But somebody has to, someone has to have sacrifice and jump in and get burned. 
and it was Amalek. So this tremendous amount of this tremendous love, how do they say it, the Arabs? Okay, they believe that they will defeat the Jewish people. Why? Because Jews love life and they love death. Yeah. Love death, yeah? Where does that come from? The love of death. Their, their energy is from the connection of Esav and Ishmael. What came out of Esav and Ishmael? Amalek! Marriage-wise, that's what came out. So when we see them with their tremendous sacrifice, willing to give up their lives, willing to be shot, they know that they're going to get killed. Or at least neutralized. Whatever that means. So, <clears throat> it's from Ishmael. Amazing thing. So, that's what Rav Chaim Vital, that's what Chaim, Rav Chaim Vital is telling us. Lewis, what, uh, are we on the two minute warning yet? No. Okay. Ten minute warning. Nine, ten, whatever. <laughs> well, I see. It's my two minute warning here. Okay. <clears throat> Rav Chaim Vital is telling us some found, two, two tremendous foundations here. Number one, that in the end of days, Ishmael, Islam, will have, will rule over parts of the world and will rule over parts of the Jewish people. Okay, tremendous prophecy. Number two, he tells us another foundation. This is a not a spiritual war, which means they're not coming after our Torah. It is a war of to annihilate the Jewish people. It's like people call them Nazis. Well, if you have a problem with it, well, you might have to complain against Rav Chaim Vital. That's what he says. It's annihilation to swallow up and finish off the Jewish people. That's how bad the exile of Ishmael is. Chafetz Chaim has a tremendous insight. The holy Chafetz Chaim passed away 1933. 1933 says the following, if you look at the verse of the Torah, when Yishmael is born, in the, in the portion of Lech Lecha, it says, okay, He will be in future tense. I don't get it. It should have been, He is a wild beast, a person. He has like two qualities of a person, but he's a wild animal. It should have said, Haya, he is. What is this will be? He says the Chavetz Chaim. This is brought down in Bera Torah on page 119. He writes down, specifically the Torah uses the uh, future tense. Because Yishmael will remain forever, for eternity. We talked about, is he going to repent? <laughs> he will remain for eternity a wild beast. And any people, any of the enlightened world that think that they could bring the Islam into Tarbut, into to become, to become sophisticated and become worldly, and think like we do, instead of the Mideast, the Midwest. Anyone that thinks that they can transform Islam into democracy, into America, into UK. There is no way. The Holy Chafetz Chaim, little small guy, has more brains than countries after countries. 
that were so, that, that waved the flag, the Arab Spring, they're into, why are they, why are they uprising? They're, they want democracy, they want Kentucky Fried Chicken, they want Bozo the Clown, we want McDonald's, yeah! That's why they're doing this. Whoa, did we get a slap in the face when it turned out worse than it was before. The Arab Spring, nothing new here. The Chavetz Chaim ended, and this class ends right here also. Chavetz Chaim ended by saying, Oi, what the Islam, what, what Islam, Muslims, what this wild beast will do to the Jewish people before the end of days. That's how he finished. What they will do to us, to the Jewish people, when it comes time, end of days. The words of the Chavetz Chaim. With God's help, when we come back to the subject, I don't know if it's going to be next week, but with God's help, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to go a little bit more further. How bad is this exile of Islam? And what is the future? What will be the end of Yishmael? Happy ending uh, for who? For us or for them? Stay tuned.